Good evening, friends on Facebook and YouTube. Welcome to another round of Pub Theology Online. My name is Gavin Rogers. I'm a pastor at Travis Park Church here in downtown San Antonio, and we have a great program for you tonight. You know, normally we would be at the Friendly Spot Ice House uh, near downtown San Antonio with our good friend Stephen Bailey Newman, uh, but uh, because of the COVID pandemic, we have been online for now for about three months. So you can go back to our YouTube channel or our Facebook page where most people watch. Um, and you can go back to any of our past events with pastors like Max Licato and uh, Mayor Ron Nirenberg. Uh, great uh, people last week uh, from the Black Lives Matter movement from the young ambitious activists Antonio Lee and Trevor Taylor. Uh, we've had great conversations the past few months, and you can go back and check all of our programs out online. But today I am joined with a special co-host. I am with a reporter from the San Antonio Express News, Emily Eaton. We're going to pull her up right now. Emily, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm glad that you are here. And uh, I want to introduce you, Emily. Emily is the a criminal justice enterprise reporter for the San Antonio Express News delving into homicides, police community relations, officer-involved shootings, uh, capital punishment, and officer misconduct. Previously, Emily worked uh, for two years at the Cincinnati Inquirer covering child poverty, business, and breaking news. And she's here today uh, because we have two great guests to talk about what's been happening in the world around us, in our community, not here in San Antonio, but around the nation when it comes to uh, policing. Uh, police violence and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and how we can move together to find a common ground, a common solution and creating the common good. So I'm going to bring up our two guests uh, for us today. But, but, for, but first, you want to support what we're doing here at Pub Theology. Uh, I am drinking a local beer or at least a Texas beer, the Heart of Texas Red Ale. Emily, what are you what are you drinking today? Alas, it's not local, but I am drinking yeah. a, a sangria and it's very good. Okay, so there you go. We're drinking beer and wine here at Pup Theology, and we have two amazing guests that we shouldn't be drinking in front of, a pastor and a sheriff, uh, but what the heck, it's Pup Theology. So uh, we're bringing to you uh, Sheriff uh, Javier Zalazar from the Bear County Sheriff's Department. He is our sheriff, and Dr. Sheriff, uh, Dr. Jerry Taylor uh, from Abilene Christian University. Uh, he's a professor there, and he is the founder of a great institute there called the Carl Spain Center for Race and spiritual action, which we'll talk about that later, what it means to me in my life. But welcome uh, you two to, to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be I, here. I do want to introduce the sheriff real fast, and we're going to get to uh, his little bio here. Sheriff was sworn into office to the Bear County office uh, January 1st, 2017. So he's gone almost four years as our sheriff. Prior to that, he was uh, served at the San Antonio Police Department uh, for 23 years as an officer he joined uh, the uh, SAPD at the age of 21, uh, first as a patrolman, then the downtown bike patrol, uh, then the safe unit. And uh, he served all the way up, I think, even as you did PR for them and, and worked with public relations for them for the end there. So he has a long uh, career in law enforcement here in our yes. community. Uh, thank you for being here, Sheriff, and we're glad you're here thank and you. honored that you're with us today. Uh, Dr. Derry Taylor, we talked a little bit about. Uh, he is, the, again, the the founding director of the Carl Spain Center on Race Studies and Spiritual Action. Uh, he's the associate professor of Bible, missions, and ministry at Abilene Christian University, where most of my family went as to college. I'm the, I'm the black sheep. I went to Baylor. That's how crazy I went. I went to a Church of Christ school, but I rebelled to a Baptist school. So, uh, you know, you get your rebellion all out at once. And uh, uh, he has different degrees. He got his... Um, doctorate and his master's and then his doctor in ministry at Perkins School of Theology, where's the same degree that my grandfather got at Southern Methodist University, uh, Carl Spain. And he is, that's my grandfather, Carl Spain. And he also has a degree from Southern Methodist uh, University as well. So guys, thank you for being on the program. And Emily, thank you for joining us. Uh, real fast before we dive in uh, to the he heavy, hard topics Emily will bring us, um, I really want to just ask you two to talk a little bit about your lives uh, and how you got called into what you do, but then also kind of explain what's been happening for the past uh, three months in our communities, maybe the past 10 years. Where have we been? Where are we now? And where are we going as a community? We'll start with the sheriff and then go to Dr. Taylor. Sure. So look, the reason that we're, that we're here um, is, and the, the, the course of the past three months has just been a game changer for many reasons. Uh, COVID, uh, was a total game changer, not just for law enforcement, for everybody, but it's changing the way we do things uh, on, an, on an everyday basis. I mean, shoot, we wouldn't be doing this 
uh, online if it, if it were not for for COVID. But you know what we're seeing uh, in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd um, has been a long time coming. Quite frankly, in law enforcement, uh, you know, at the end of the day, what people are are mad about, what they're demanding, is more accountability uh, on the on the part of law enforcement officers. And look, I came into law enforcement in the aftermath of Rodney King. Uh, is when I when I became a law enforcement officer. Uh, also, around the time of the O.J. Simpson trial and all of the the uh, chaos that ensued uh, after after the allegations of those against those officers in the LAPD um, surfaced. And so, you know, I came into a, a time when they were demanding certain things of law enforcement. And you know, along the way, we've made some strides, but clearly, we have not come far enough. Uh, I think the the murder of George Floyd was indicative of uh what people have been demanding uh but also it kind of showed us uh how far we have not come uh you had four officers that that uh you know the one and, and everybody's seen the video it's seared in our collective memory um but i think you 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 got a, an officer that knew he was being videotaped he knew he was going to be on a video cam on a body camera uh he knew that the world was watching and he didn't care he did what he wanted to do anyway um, I think because he felt comfortable that he was not going to be held accountable. And, and so it clearly showed that we still have some work to do. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I know that, uh, that Emily will talk about this, but one thing that we are appreciative of you is that you, for early on in your, in your tenure as sheriff, you did start making some of these changes that we're calling for now. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for that. Um, Dr. Taylor. Uh, from a different perspective, from a from a professor, pastor, you're also a pastor in the Church of Christ, um, a, a, a leader of an institute that focuses on race and spiritual action. From your point of view, uh, and, and I know that you've cared about this uh, for a while, I, uh, I want to let the, the listeners know that Dr. Taylor, uh, during the, the killing of Botham Jean in Dallas, Texas, who was a a actually a, mi a minister of music in a Church of Christ in Dallas, and um, the Church of Christ community, which is Abilene Christian University and all the other universities in Dallas and in other places, rallied around in a prayer summit around Botham John's, John's family. And uh, Dr. Taylor's been very concerned about uh, what's been happening in our world around us. So tell us a little about yourself, doctor, and uh, of where we've been and where we're going. Well, it's good to be with you uh, this evening. Um, I grew up in a rural community in West Tennessee a little town called Millington, Tennessee. Um, I started high school, uh, the early days of public school integration. And I experienced uh, a tremendous amount of uh, racial hostility uh, during that period where black bodies and white bodies uh, were having to occupy the same uh, physical space, and there were those who were resistant to that. Uh, and during that period in the 70s, uh, there were race riots. Uh, we had heard and rumored uh, prior to me attending high school uh, that there were race riots at the high school. And when I actually got there, uh, the heat level was still hot. Uh, and so I learned early on uh, the hurt and the harm that uh, racial hostility can do uh, to all people who get touched by it. And so I have sought to uh, give my life to doing whatever I can uh, to help uh, bring about peace in the midst of our society because I believe uh, that if I don't do what I can do as an individual citizen uh, to keep the peace that we have made, uh, we will lose the peace. And once the peace is gone, it is very difficult to recover it again. Uh, and so uh, that is why I'm, I'm involved in the work that I'm involved in because I, I don't want to see this country spiral out of control uh, and to witness our external enemies uh, having uh, a standing ovation, uh, applauding us for how well we are actually destroying and killing one another. And so um, 
that is why uh, I'm involved in this work and we are also carrying on the work in the Carl Stein Center uh, for Race Studies and Spiritual Action at ACU because we believe that the only true solutions to social problems uh, would have to be spiritual in nature because those social problems grow out of people uh, who have uh, a toxic spirit. And so we have to address that uh, from a spiritual perspective. No, that's that's really well spoken. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Uh, we're going to continue our discussion with Dr. Taylor in, in a few minutes uh, once we speak to the sheriff. But I want to ask you one question, Dr. Taylor, before you go. And I want you to share a little bit about what you're doing Saturday and invite people to participate uh, in what you're doing Saturday online if people are so-called uh, to, to do those type of things. Uh, and I have one more question. You're at Abilene Christian University. Uh, in 1960, my grandfather uh, was a Bible professor there, newly hired Bible professor, maybe there one or two years. And he... He grew up in a very segregated town in Opelika, Alabama, uh, saw racism uh, for, like, right in front of his face. Uh, him, and his, his, him and his father, my great-grandfather, uh, got their general store burned down that they operated because they decided to minister to African-American citizens in Opelika, Alabama. They baptized them into their church and did not like it, and they got their place burned down. So when he came to ACU in 1960, uh, and he saw that Abilene Christian University was not allowing people of color into the school to even receive a Bible degree. He gave a speech challenging that, and uh, we can talk about that more later. Um, but it, it shook up the place because it's, it was 100% white, people of power, people of privilege. He called them worshipers of Jim Crow more than Jesus Christ. This speech was extremely, uh, I can barely read it today without looking and getting in trouble, right? So, um, how have you seen change happen in an environment like ACU in Christian institutions? Uh, what is what? Where are we going? And what are the thing? What's the thing you're putting on Saturday to get us there? So, well, um, uh, Dr. Spain set an example for uh, all of us uh, to exercise courage uh, in the midst of our own communities to speak truth uh, to those who may be abusing power, using. Uh, their position to deny the humanity of others. And he stood boldly there in 1960, February 24th. I was born a year later, 1961, February 27. Uh, but he confronted uh, his community uh, with the risk of being rejected, with the risk of being despised and attacked and assaulted. Uh, and that's why we felt it necessary to name the center in his honor uh, because he represented what it really means to stand up and speak up and to put your career, uh, your resources, your relationships on the line to stand for what is right. And I think we need more of that today in every social institution in this country, including the church. We need more people like Dr. Spain uh, that will, will be courageous in standing for what is right, no matter the cost, even if it cost us our lives. We have to stand for what is right. Uh, and oh. If we fail to do that, um, there will be no hope for the rest of us. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I'm emotional. Uh, thank you for leading a program uh, in an institution uh, that even carries the, the dream of so many people, uh, mm -hmm. the people that he, uh, that uh, were blessed by a lot. Finally, when ACU decided to, to make that change, um, yeah. Uh, name it. Name name a few people who were the first witnesses of that um, of that change. Uh, I think Billy Curl and Larry. Billy Curl. Yeah, uh, they were the first two African American uh, students to be admitted uh, into ACU uh, ACC at the time, as a result of Dr. Spain's speech. Um, and I think what Dr. Spain represented was that that kind of courage. Uh, does not derive from politics. It does not derive from any entity of this world. It has to come from a deeper place. And that's what we are uh, seeking to do uh, at, at ACU uh, through the Carl Spain Center. And this event that we're having on Saturday is going out of what we call prayer meditation think tanks uh, to where uh, we have people in various groups that have committed their time to studying material uh, 
uh, re related to police reform um, and looking at life uh, through the eyes of police officers and seeking to understand uh, their worldview. And so the reform must not be an attack. It must be an effort to understand uh, so that we can move forward being spiritually motivated uh, to ask for responsible police reform. Uh, we do not see the police as our enemies. Uh, we're all a part of the community here in this country and we have to uh, give each other the benefit of the doubt and to honor and to respect each other's humanity and work together for sensible uh, solutions. And me being a, a professor and a pastor and a Christian, I believe that God is the source of, of true wisdom. And if we would just uh, appeal to him and seek that, I think we would be better off as a society. Great. And thank you, Dr. Taylor, for that. And it means a lot uh, to my family, but also just the entire Abilene Christian University family for your leadership there. Um, my dream, my dream is to have it called the Spain and Taylor Center. If that would, I think that'd be more appropriate. Um, uh, I'm serious. I, I, um, you, if you're interested in registering for any of those prayer think tanks that doc, uh, Dr. Taylor's talking about, it's in our comments below. Uh, and you can, you can see, uh, see that there and register online and join us on Saturday afternoon. Uh, thank you for being with us. You're going to be back with us toward the end of the program, Dr. Taylor. And okay. so stick around. And uh, as we talk to the, to the sheriff of Bear County. Okay. Thanks Great so much. Sure. Uh, doc, uh, doctor, Dr. Sheriff Halazar. <laughs> sure. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, thank you for being with us. We're joined again with Emily Eaton from the Express News. And uh, mm -hmm. we're just going to have a conversation with you uh, just about sure. uh uh, just policing here in, in Bear County and the city of San Antonio and our communities around us. So Emily will ask the, the first question and grateful for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you for joining us, Sheriff. Um, you know, after the death of George Floyd in May, you were one of the first county and city officials that came out and spoke up and supported the Black Lives Matter movement. We were at the courthouse mm -hmm. and there was a, a rally out front and a lot of demonstrators asked you if you'd be willing to walk with them, march with them, say that Black Lives Matter, and, and you you did. Um, I'm wondering what led you to vocally support the Black Lives Matter movement, and why now? Um, well, because it's, it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. At the end of the day, um, you know, although we, we don't always agree with the um, steps being taken or the methods, methods being used by some of the, the protesters that we've seen, uh, in other parts of the of the country, mostly, uh, we do agree with what they're saying. They're just at the end of the day, they want us to be better at our job. And so, uh, you know, certainly it's it's my job to to foster that change within the profession that I love. I've been doing this. I've been in this profession going on 28 years now, uh, more than half my life. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, they're just they're just asking us to do better and be better and do the right thing. So to me, supporting that is, is absolutely the right thing to do. Well, you talk a little bit about wanting to foster that change. And one of the really interesting dynamics that has emerged in this movement is the difference between some of these very mm -hmm. small changes, some of these changes to policies or the creation of a police community relations committee, which of course has happened in San Antonio before, um, mm -hmm. and the idea of <clears throat> big structural change of really changing um, the whole I, whole way that we think about law enforcement and the way that we think about funding police. Mm -hmm. When you think about those two different questions, sort of where, what do you think? Where, how do you think change happens? Well, it's got to be holistic. It's got to be the whole body. Um, and it's got to be every step of the process. So it does me no good to change a policy um, that, that, you know, change our use of force policy. It does me no good to not have the training to go along with that, to not have the accountability to go along with that. Heck, let's go back even further. It does me no good to have that if I'm not recruiting and hiring and training the right kind of people that would subscribe to that school of thought. And so it's got to be a holistic approach. You have to change the way you're doing it from the onset, from the very first time somebody steps foot inside your training academy as a brand new day one cadet. Uh, to issuing discipline through them and training throughout their career uh, to the day that they exit the, the agency, uh, retiring 30 years into it. 
you know, you've got to make sure that you're, you've got that continuity through your, throughout your whole system. And so when you say we've got to foster change, it's not just a matter of changing the black and white on a policy. That's the easy part. The, the hard part is, is, is training it, retraining it, holding people accountable to the extent that you have to, even though it's a, it's a very distasteful uh, thing to have to do. Uh, but you got to be willing to do it all. It's all or none. So we're, I'm going to switch subjects a little bit and talk a little bit about this renewed focus on use of force incidents in San Antonio. Um, you know, we've heard a lot of demonstrators in San Antonio talking about the cases of Marquise Jones and Antroni Scott. And of course, those are cases that happened at the San Antonio Police Department, which is a right. separate agency. Um, but you know, there's also some uh, high profile use of force cases that happened at the Bear County Sheriff's Office, including um, the death of Norman Cooper and the death of um, uh, Amanda Jones and Cameron Prescott um, when shortly after you took office. Can you talk to the extent that you can, can you talk about those cases? Um, do you think that those deputies should have been indicted? Well, the Cameron Prescott case, I, obviously I can't say too much about it. It's an, it's an ongoing, uh, there's ongoing litigation regarding uh, that case. You know, I, I think that, the, that those cases were brought to the grand jury. Uh, and I think that I think the grand jury looked at all evidence uh, available and then made their decisions. So of course, I'm going to respect the decision of the of the grand jury. But but, uh, you know, with that being said, nothing I can say could ever justify uh, the death of a, of a six year old boy. Yeah. Well, on that note, um, for some of the viewers who don't know um, the case um, involving Cameron Prescott, um, it involved, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sheriff, but uh, a woman was fleeing from deputies. And um, as she was fleeing, it was like a long chase. And after some time, um, the deputies approached her outside of a mobile home park and she appeared to have something in her hand and um, she lifted it or the deputies thought that she might lift it and they, they shot at her. And unfortunately there was a six year old boy behind her. Um, and Sheriff, we, we talked at the time um, about that case and about some of the policies at the sheriff's office. You mentioned that you were going to review policies um, and see if there was anything that needed to change. I mean, it, it didn't have necessarily anything to do with the fact that um, some of the deputies could have done wrong, but it was just like, how can we do better? What, what training can we do that would prevent something like this from happening? What was the conclusion of that review of policy? Did you... Um, find anything that needed to be changed. Oh, absolutely. So, so we just put out a, a brand new policy um, here very recently that that is all encompassing. And and look, it's not the last time we're going to change policy. To me, I've said this before: uh, a true law enforcement policy is a living document. Uh, you've got to always be reviewing it and and you know altering it, tweaking it here and there. Sometimes it's a wholesale change that needs to be made. You've got to be factoring in things like case law. Uh, new trends, uh, certainly cases like the George Floyd murder, that's a monumental case in law enforcement. Um, you've, uh, you've got to be able to fold all that into this living document and then evolve your, your policy uh, accordingly. And so that's, so this latest policy that we have uh, that just came out um, is to me just that. It's the, it's the latest and greatest. Uh, and, and again, but, it'll, but it'll, it's most certainly going to change as, as our profession evolves and, and more demands are made on us. I'm going to pivot again real quick because there's so many big issues here when we're talking about um, police conduct and, and racial bias. Another really big issue in San Antonio is, of course, collective bargaining. And mm -hmm. a lot of that has focused on the San Antonio Police Department. But I know that um, collective bargaining is coming up for the Bear County Sheriff's Office as well. Can you talk a little bit about that process? And can you talk a little bit about how your contract currently works? Um, sure. For, for example, are you allowed to discipline someone um, after 180 days? That's one of the big things that, that comes up well, with CPD. We've got limits. Uh, so so at the, the, what, the way our, our, our contract process is working right now, there was a contract that came into effect right before I took office. And so I kind of uh, have to live with what I've got. But right now, we're actually entering into negotiations with the, the DSABC, the Deputy Sheriff's Association of Bear County. Several of my chiefs are, are basically taking what, what I'd like to see implemented into this. Uh, but I'm also asking for, for public input, which we can get to here in just a little bit. And yeah. then we're negotiating. We're, we're actually starting to go to the negotiating table with the DSABC 
uh, to figure out what it is that they'd like to see happen and what it is that we'd like to see happen, but also what it is that the, the, the Bear County or the, the Bear County would like to see happen. So it's a three party uh, contract that's that's going on right now. You know, and, Sheriff. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm just curious. Um, is there anything in particular that you would like to see changed? Um, yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple things uh, I would like to see um, some citizen advisory uh, measures put into place on discipline with matters to dis uh, when it comes to discipline. Um, not that I've got a problem with discipline or that I'm squeamish in the least, but I feel that, that citizens should have an opportunity to weigh in on that. So that's one thing I'd like to see. Another thing I'd like to see, and I, you know, unfortunately I, I proposed it a while back, but, but it was met with uh, grievance on the part of the DSABC, uh, what is an early intervention program to where, uh, you know, we've all seen, you guys have, have seen, uh, where here I am on the five o'clock news again, talking about a deputy that's gotten themselves in trouble, run afoul of the law, and I'm, I'm angrily saying that we're going to fire this person, and then I do. But I think, gosh, what if we would have been able to, to detect some of those patterns of behavior or misbehavior, as it were, and correct it before it becomes problematic? Get them into rehab, get them into counseling of some sort, uh, anger management of some sort. Let's, let's intervene. And so all we try to do was, was implement an intervention program. Uh, Non-punitive, just, you know, hey, if you need help, we're going to get you some help before you become a problem and before you end your career or, or worse. Um, and so I'd like to I'd like to implement that into the contract as, as well. Uh, and, I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm fairly confident that the public is demanding such things at this point. So uh, while it is on my wish list, I, I, I'm going to really, really uh, press hard for some of those things. Uh, right now, also, one of the one of the moves that I made here not too long ago uh, was I actually asked for public input on that contract. Right. We, we actually have a, a website, uh, bearcountysheriff.com, where you can go. We put up, we uploaded a whole, uh, an actual uh, copy of the contract. So you can read it cover to cover. I think it's 90, 90 some odd pages. You can read it cover to cover. You can click on a link and it sends us an email on things that you'd suggest from a citizen's perspective, what you think needs to be in there. That's really and interesting. Yeah, and tell us how people like, are you going to go around or are you going to have town halls about uh, of this topic and get that input as well? Or is it just mainly right now? I guess the town halls are kind of bad right now. But so how are people are going to get engaged if they can't jump online, which we're going to put that website on right now? Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we're probably going to have to do something via Zoom. But right now we're still in the process of getting a lot of good emails. Uh, you know, today I was actually talking to Johnny Garcia, my my public information officer, and he was actually saying, hey, well, a lot of the a lot of the emails uh, that we're getting some of them are, are making suggestions for people that clearly read the document and, and you know saw some things that they think could be improved upon this is a lot of a lot of them are just saying uh you know kudos to the administration you guys are, are doing exactly what you need to be doing keep doing more of the same i'm okay with that uh but but i do i certainly do want that that input from the from the public that's great and, and, you go to and yeah, so, so to answer i'm sorry so pastor to answer your question yeah. uh we will probably do uh some some zoom type stuff when the time comes all right, good. That's just different ways to get involved. BearCountySheriff.com. You can learn about that. Uh, uh, one of your good friends and uh, leaders in your in your department uh, sent me that earlier. So we're going to try to post some links more back up where people can see the document and mm -hmm. uh, get that. But if you can't, if you can go right now to BearCountySheriff.com. But here's a question I have because I'm not as smart as Emily, and I don't cover this every day. <laughs> None of us. I are. have. None of us are. I have a hard time. <laughs> I have a hard time deciding. Like, okay, like. It's the San Antonio Police Department. It's the Bear <laughs> County Sheriff's Department. There's a, you know, there's a union for the county. There's a union for the, the city. For, you know, we have all these things and all these different angles to try to figure out. Because when you solve one thing with some union, it may be different from the other. First, Absolutely. tell us a little bit about, educate the layman here <laughs> about the difference between the Sheriff's Department and the Police Department. Uh, talk sure. about different numbers of patrol versus how many work in jails, what your primary job is. Tell us a little bit about that so we can kind of educate ourselves on the lingo. Sure. Um, so the SAPD, the San Antonio Police Department, where I grew up and spent most of my career before becoming the elected sheriff for Bear County, um, polices the city of San Antonio. Sure. Uh, the county seat for the county, the vast majority. So out of, out of about 1.8, probably close to 2 million Bear County residents, 1.3 million live within the city of San Antonio. So the, the San Antonio Police Department is their primary responding agency. Uh, when, yeah. when a city of San Antonio resident dials 911, it rings at the SAPD automatically. 
Um, my deputies have jurisdiction within the sure. city of San Antonio. We've got countywide jurisdiction. So we provide law enforcement services to the whole county. Um, uh, you know, two, two, almost 2 million Bear County residents, 1200 square miles. Uh, so, so our deputies, uh, not we only, we also, I mean, we provide, uh, calls for service as well, you know, uh, to, uh, to the unincorporated areas. So basically the donut around San Antonio, the unincorporated areas, uh, but also the smaller areas within San Antonio. So Alamo Heights, almost park, you know, you get the idea of Windcrest, all the smaller cities. We also, so we've got countywide concurrent jurisdiction with everybody. Here's where some of the main differences are between the San Antonio Police Department or between a police department and a sheriff's office. Sure. Police officers for a city department don't have civil jurisdiction. We do, okay, as, as sheriffs and, and deputies. Uh, so eviction notices, divorce paperwork, civil lawsuits, we, we serve all of that civil paperwork. So we've got a division that that's all they do. Um, so we, we provide the police services just like they do. I've got patrol officers, patrol deputies, and SWAT teams, and, and homicide detectives, and SVU detectives. I've got all that stuff, but I've also got a group of detectives that, that are a group of deputies that, that serve civil process and, and things of that nature. We're also responsible for uh, security at the Bear County Courthouse Complex. So the, when I say the complex, it's, it's, it's a series of three buildings downtown that are that's our, our courthouse complex, plus the juvenile court on, on, the, it's on the south side over there off of Proban. Uh, we're responsible for security in, in there. Um, through the doors of those various courthouse facilities, three million visitors pass on a yearly basis. Uh, you know, lawyers, uh, judges, you know, witnesses, jurors. We're responsible for all of their safety and security while they're in that in those in those facilities. Uh, so that's one of the things that we're that we're also uh, tasked with. Uh, but additionally, we're tasked with running the Bear County Jail uh, by constitution. Every sheriff is the is the the keeper of the jail, and so uh, that's a, that's a full time job in and of itself. So you wanted to talk about numbers at full strength. The sheriff's office has about fifteen hundred deputies. Uh, the vast majority. And a lot of people say, "Well, gosh, it, it doesn't seem like you'd be that big. I don't see that many of you." Well, of sure. the fifteen hundred allotted positions, nine hundred of them are in the jail. So the wow. vast majority of the public will never see the vast majority of my deputies. It's like it's a bit like an iceberg. You know, you're only going to see the tip above water, but you don't see the monstrosity that's under under sea. Well, that's that's the same with us. Um, there's also a contingent of deputies that are assigned to the courthouse. So unless you're doing business at the courthouse, you're not going to see them either. What you see typically is my deputies out on patrol or civil serving civil process. So we're a bit smaller um, uh, personnel wise than the SAPD. We've got about 1500 at full strength. I think when I left the SAPD uh, about four years ago, they were about 2300 uh, officers and so it's it's a little bit smaller than the uh, operation although we've got a bigger area of responsibility okay good and one, one last question to clarify and then we'll get back into some some questions not only questions from emily who will have great questions uh but also from uh, our audience if you are listening you can ask a question we have one from nadia coming here coming up and we'll post that uh we'll bet those and post those on our facebook page you can ask any type of question here we're an open book at pub theology and uh, we want real conversation to happen. So when it comes to these unions and the unions that uh, represent the San Antonio Police Department and also the, sher the, the sheriffs uh, uh, in Bear County, uh, they're separate unions. Uh, they fight for obviously um, uh, for both of those entities. So the people representing mm -hmm. the unions are going to fight for the, what they believe is the best mm -hmm. rights for the, you know, their, their department uh, and, their, and their officers that represent their union. Sure. When we talk about these contracts, a lot of people think, oh, it's the sheriff, it's the chief McManus that deals with this. Like, it's, you know, they're the leaders of this contract. Well, really, it's a negotiation between the governing body of either the county or the city striking a compromise or a deal with these unions. How mm -hmm. do we as a public engage that? And if we're going to protest, where do we rightly protest to? And where, where is our voice going to be heard the most if we want to seek changes in some of these contracts? Well, for me, it's as simple as clicking on that little button and sending us an email telling us what sure. it is that you'd like to see, good or bad. Um, you know, so so yeah, with with uh, with my the union that I'm negotiating, uh, in interending into negotiations with right now is the DSABC Deputy Sheriffs Association of Bear County. Uh, the association for the San Antonio Police Department is SAPOA, San Antonio Police Officers Association. Two different entities altogether, um, and so for theirs, I don't think that their contract 
uh, negotiations start until next year. But next we're, year, yeah. we're well into starting ours right now. And we, again, we'd love to have that, that uh, feedback, uh, bearcountysheriff.com. Okay. Well, uh, Emily, uh, you, you take the next question, and then we're going to go to some online, online questions here. Uh, well, you know me, Sheriff. I saved the, the hardest one for last. No, oh, um, <laughs> this isn't last. This isn't last. This is not your last question. We got we got okay, more coming after. That. That one uh, well, <laughs> I wanted to pivot a little bit since we are talking um, during pub theology. I'm curious how um, how your faith guides your um, your leadership at the Bear County Sheriff's Office. Well, I mean, I I, I think that you know I I am a man of faith. I grew up Catholic pastor. But I, I, but I defected to a Baptist university when I got my degree at Wayland Baptist University. Um, yeah. But with that being said, uh, you know, I let my faith guide me in every in everything that I do. Um, and so, I, if I had to, if I had to just sum it all up into one thing, uh, you do the right thing, not the easy thing, and and that's going to abide by the Bible any day of the week, as far as I'm concerned. Where is your faith now taking you in this journey when, when, when people of color's lives really matter, when black lives matter, in this movement of where we are as a society and how we move past it? How has your faith guided you in that process, especially in interacting with our citizens on the streets? Well, uh, again, as I said before, in the, in the, uh, when we were backstage waiting for this, this to start, um, I think this was a long time coming. I think this, these, these demands, these demands that were, are being made of us is nothing new. Um, you know, it, it's, I came into this profession almost 28 years ago and we were, we were, those same demands were being made of us then. And clearly what we all saw on, on TV with the murder of George Floyd clearly shows that we're, that we've got a long ways to go. Um, I got to think that my God is not happy about what he sees, uh, when he, when he looks down on us, but I would hope, I would hope that w when he sees into my heart and sees what I'm trying to do and sees what I desperately want to do um, and sees the direction I'm going in, I hope that makes him smile. I hope that makes him happy. I hope that pleases him. That's good. Uh, and we're going to continue this conversation with Emily and uh, Dr. Taylor here, but we are going to take some questions from online. Uh, Nadia has a question. Her first question says this. Uh, how, can you speak to us about the hiring process along with a number of psych tech our psych test that each officer receives before being hired and the start of the academy process. Yeah, so that that uh, recruitment process is something that, that I uh, I changed a bit, a lot, quite a bit. When I took over, we had one uh, background investigator doing doing background checks. He was a part timer, a part time deputy that that uh, no slam on this gentleman, but I, I think he's just doing the job that he was put there to do. Uh, it's my second day as sheriff, and I met him uh, in the administrative offices, and they said, this is our, our background investigator. And he, within a couple minutes, he made two inappropriate jokes right there in front of me. And so that day, I walked into my chief, and I said, you, you've got to be kidding me. We've got to be doing better than this. Where's the rest of my background investigator? Well, that's what you got. And, and so we made some changes. We, we, uh, my recruiters at the time were civilians, civilian employees, which I've got great civilian employees. But but when you're recruiting deputies, uh, a civilian can't really paint that picture for them and sell them on that lifestyle of, of wanting to be in this uniform. And so we revamped it. We, we created an applicant processing unit with investigators that do, honest to goodness, really thorough background checks. Uh, we've got recruiters that are, that are very, very outgoing and bubbly and are great at selling the lifestyle to, to prospective recruits and telling them, hey, here's all the reasons why I shouldn't be wearing this uniform. I'm a single mom. Uh, I didn't have my education when I started. I, I come from a poor family, uh, but I overcame all those things. And here I am wearing this uniform and I'm proud to wear it. And so, so we, we got it. Just getting those people in the door is, is one thing, um, but running them through the ringer. So we, I've tightened up my, my hiring uh, practices uh, quite a bit. Uh, I think that's that's made the news quite a bit as well. We made it tougher to get into the sheriff's office. Um, so I've got about a 13 step process to get in. Uh, background check is, is pretty exhaustive. Uh, there's certain offenses that uh, it used to be when I first took over the agency, you could actually get on with certain types of arrests on your record. If it was dismissed, you could still apply and you could still become a law enforcement officer with a DWI arrest on your record, for example. Um, 
whether it was dismissed or not. I actually tightened it up and said, no, I don't care if it's a if it's a, a conviction or a dismissal. And, and you know, you, you just the fact that you got arrested for DWI, I don't even want you on this on this agency. And so I tightened down, down those procedures. Uh, we've got a polygraph uh, that they have to go through. We've got a review board that, that they have to go through. They've actually got to be interviewed by a series of of deputies that'll ask them a series of questions, scenarios that they'll put them in, knowing full well that they they may not come from a law enforcement background. Uh, but they take the they take the polygraph, they take uh, of course a drug screening, uh, physical test, written test, uh, and then of course the psychological. And that's one of the things that I'm also proud to say that 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 I did a, the, a first of at the sheriff's office, is I actually had the distinction of hiring the first ever truly dedicated law enforcement psychologist into the sheriff's office. They used to have one many years ago that this this gentleman I'm told was a very good psychologist, but he worked for the jail side and then he would kind of pull double duty and and, and work with the work, work with the deputies, which is great. He, he, he was probably very, very good at what he did. But to me, I needed a law enforcement psychologist. So I actually lured one from the San Antonio Police Department, Dr. Brandy Burke. And since I think 2006, she's been working strictly with law enforcement, first responders and military. So she understands what what goes on up here uh, for for uh, a first responder, and so we run our our, our applicants through the through the ringer, um, and our and we put them through uh, the detention academy, which is I, I believe we still have the record for being the longest detention academy in the state of Texas. Now, time wise, it's actually about eight weeks, but we cram ten weeks of material into it because they work longer days, they work ten hour days, and so we're we're cramming a lot of information in. But it's so we're not just covering the state minimums. We're also doing things like uh, we've implemented the EPIC program at the sheriff's office. EPIC stands for Ethical Policing is Courageous. It is an ethics program uh, created by the by the uh, the New Orleans Police Department several years back that they're helping to to revamp the way they do things there. We implemented it here, so our deputies get uh, a full. Uh, uh, a full class of, of EPIC as they're immersed into the culture of the sheriff's office. And then EPIC is also taught every year at, at in-service as well. So we've got a pretty pretty robust uh, recruitment, uh, applicant processing, and training system going on at the sheriff's office. I'm very proud of the things that we've done with it. Well, thank you for answering that question. And Nadia, thank you for answering that. Continue uh, asking your questions to our guests and Dr. De Dr. Jerry Taylor when he, he comes back on. Uh, Emily. Yeah, Sheriff, this is something you actually touched on, and it, it relates to a question that Brenda Clark just brought up on the on the live comments. Um, it says, what are your thoughts on other police departments like Leon Valley hiring police that SAPD and other departments fired or disciplined for improper behavior? And for a little context for the viewers, um, I wrote a story that was published um, last week, and it was in the Sunday paper about three officers from the um, San Antonio Police Department that were fired by the police chief there. And they later were hired in Leon Valley. Um, that's allowed because they were never uh, convicted or adjudicated for a crime. And so as a result, um, nothing happens to their license in Texas. Um, and since then, some uh, Kins Five also did a, a report about Leon Valley. And Sheriff, you talked about your hiring practices and not wanting to hire someone that has a DWI. What are your thoughts on how other departments hire people with accusations in their past? And when do you think it's okay to hire someone um, that has a disciplinary action from their past? Well, you know, every agency's got their own way of doing things. And certainly, I, you know, I couldn't, uh, you know, be too tough on, on Joe Salvaggio over there at Leon Valley. I mean, he's been doing this job a long time. So, I mean, he reviewed those cases, something about them made him feel comfortable enough in, in hiring them. But I'll say this, when we're going through our um, folks that are, that are processing in, if they've got uh, the appearance of being uh, a gypsy cop, what we, what we call it in our, in our industry term, to use an industry term, gypsy cop, uh, they go from agency to agency to agency, usually, not every case, but usually, because they're disciplined, they, they don't ever let it catch up with them. Or a chief will cut a deal with them and say, look, if you resign, I'll give you an honorable discharge and then you go somewhere else. Uh, I don't want you here, but go apply somewhere else and we'll give you a, 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 an honorable discharge on your way out the door. But if, if, and I personally review every file of every 
person before they start our academy. And I'll look through them. And if I see that it looks like they've done some some agency jumping and they've been a gypsy cop, I just flat out won't hire them. I don't want to take the chance on on being the next victim and then finding out later that, oh, man, this guy's got all kinds of, uh, you know, honorable discharges. And, and yet here we are having having a problem with them. So we do our best to keep those those gypsies out of, of our agency. Uh, but additionally, when we show somebody the door, and, and unfortunately, it's something that I've had to do many, many times, uh, and I'll probably have to do it many, many more times before it's all said and done. Um, we are truthful when it comes to those um, discharge paperwork, those F5s. Uh, if, if you're an honorable uh, dishonorable discharge, you're going to it's going to show dishonorable discharge or general discharge. Uh, we're not going to, uh, to use a term that I've used before and it sounds horrible, we're not going to pass the trash, uh, kick the can down the road and let it be somebody else's problem. We're going to be truthful with our forms, which I think I'd like to see some legislation that forces our hand as chiefs and sheriffs and, and say nice. that we're not allowed to cut deals and, and, you know, you resign and I'll give you this honorable discharge. Call it what it is. Call him, call him a bad cop if that's what he is. Well, thank you. That reminds us to be involved in our legislation. You know, Sheriff, you said that sometimes that you would like to have legislation different. Uh, and that reminds people to go out and vote, go out and challenge uh, the, the elected officials like our state mm -hmm. reps, our, our county commissioners, our city council that can really make these great changes. You know, we had on a few weeks ago, uh, former Councilman Ray Saldana, who is now the CEO of Communities and Schools in Washington, D.C., over the whole shebang of Communities and Schools. Um, mm -hmm. But he, uh, when he was council person, right toward the end of his tenure, he made a recommendation to try to change some of the disciplinary actions in the police contract, and he wasn't able to do it, right? And so if mm -hmm. we continue pressing our elected officials to make these changes, it makes your job and the chief's job a, a lot easier because then you have better protocol to follow. And, right. Uh, and I and that just th thank you for reminding us of that. Um, and continue asking those questions. We'll get back to those questions here in a second. Emily, let's continue having this great dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the other things that has a really renewed focus, and you, you've talked a little bit about this recently, um, is police training. And as sheriff, mm -hmm. of course, you have expanded training. I believe it's from seven weeks to twelve weeks. Is that correct? Uh, well, yeah. Our, our our training academy is about 10 weeks worth of material crammed into eight weeks. Uh, but but I've also doubled the amount of hours, the number of hours spent in in-service training, annual in-service training, uh, from the state minimum 20 or so hours that it was when I took over uh, to 40 hours. Uh, we do a 40-hour in-service cycle. So on that note, I mean, obviously, you've made a whole lot of changes in training um, at the Bear County Sheriff's Office. There's one aspect of training that I think a lot of people don't necessarily know about. It's this concept of stress inoculation. Mm -hmm. And um, for the viewers, that's essentially when you place a cadet or an aspiring law enforcement officer in a really stressful situation. And um, in most cases, you force them to not force them, they're taking part, but they are fighting in an MMA style ring. Um, it often leads to broken noses, bruises, mm -hmm. you name it. Um, I'm sure you did it when you were going through the San Antonio Police Department. Sure. Still got a crooked nose from it. <laughs> I, well, I never noticed. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the concept behind it, of course, is that um, you want to make sure that law enforcement deputies can handle any situation that comes their way, that they mm -hmm. can handle someone punching them and be able to still be aware of their surroundings. Can you talk a little bit about why stress inoculation exists and if there should be any extra scrutiny now that we're looking at um, de-escalation techniques and trying to avoid this type of use of force. So yeah, look, I think there is definitely a place, a, a time and a place to teach a cadet stress inoculation and to teach them that yes, people are going to punch you in the face at some point in your career. And guess what? It may break your nose <laughs> uh, and it's going to hurt. But you're not going to die, you know. And and but we just we do need to show them uh, how to be that tough law enforcement officer that's required of us. Sometimes we got to get rough sometimes, and and it's unfortunate. However, you also got to show them that there you can also just the way the way uh, force is escalated, you should also be able you have to be able to be to adapt and de-escalate that situation. So when the handcuffs go on, the fight's over. Uh, you won. He's wearing handcuffs. The fight's over with at that point. Now it's time to render aid to those that may be injured. Now it's time to handle the paperwork. Now it's time to do the boring part of the job 
and you have to be equally good, if not better at that, uh, to, to make sure that you're, that you're going to, to do things the right way. We also need to be preparing our troops to, to know that not every call is going to go bad. Not every call is going to involve somebody trying to punch you in the nose. Uh, some of them just involve you taking uh, a burglary report from Mrs. Martinez, who is terrified right now because somebody uh, broke into her home and she just really needs a shoulder to cry on and, and be that reassuring guardian. Uh, so we need to be showing our troops to be well-rounded. I mean, I think I know when I when I took over when I came into the into the SAPD, uh, they trained they did a really good job of training us to be uh, that tough, hard uh soldier almost uh you know don't shake hands with people because they might grab your hand and pull you in and punch you uh and so we were terrified you we thought everybody that tried to shake our hand was just was going to try to kill us and so over the years though we've done a good job of, of adapting that um clearly some agencies have more work to do in that area um absolutely we've got more work to do too but that's that's what, what that's one of the constant struggles to make sure that we're training them to be well-rounded uh to not necessarily be that soldier that's always under siege it's always at war but to be that guardian that knows how to be uh, soft and tender when the when the situation calls for. I think uh, we'll pivot again to another question from um, Brenda Clark, um, and I believe someone else actually brought this up at a different point. What are your thoughts on qualified immunity for police officers? Well, I I I think I believe the reason that it was it was created and put into place was so that we could do our job and not not live in fear that, you know, I'm going to get sued and I'm going to lose my home and my family is going to be homeless because all I was just trying to do was do my job. But unfortunately, I think that there's been, it's been um, in some instances over the years, over the decades, uh, overused. And I think it's like anything else, it's been abused. So I'm, I'm not necessarily a fan of stripping that away, but, but certainly making sure that we're putting it in a box and using it appropriately if and when it needs to be used. But sometimes uh, people need to be held accountable up to and including a uh, civil process. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your questions. We're going to continue with that. Keep asking questions. Uh, I'm going to bring back uh, a man I truly respect from Abilene Christian University. Uh, and we had him on earlier. So if you just joined us, hit the rewind button and you can learn more about uh, Dr. Cher Dr. Jerry Taylor from Abilene Christian University. <clears throat> Doctor, welcome back onto the program. Thank you. It's so weird to say program. Like we're usually we're usually at a bar. Like it's not so formal, you know. <laughs> but welcome back to the 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 uh, the, the beer table here. And um, I know you have a question uh, for the for the sheriff. Um, based on some of the reading uh, that I've been doing. Um, I discovered that policing in America emerged out of what was known as slave patrols. Mm -hmm. uh, there were people responsible for making sure that the slaves did not uh, violently rebel, uh, that they were transported from one plantation to the next, uh, so they had to be policed. And so I'm wondering, even though uh, police departments have come a very long way uh, from that period of time, um, what kind of vetting process uh, do you have in place uh, to check to see uh, what the racial animus might be in police officers? I know in uh, 1978, I believe it was, one of the most horrific mass murders happened in Guyana, uh, carried out by Jim Jones. Jim Jones. Uh, as a result of that, uh, the religious denomination of which he was a part uh, put into place a very strict ordination process uh, to, to vet ministers who would gravitate uh, mm -hmm. towards power that may not be uh, psychologically healthy. Sure. And so what, what I'm uh, wanting to get clarity on, is there any standardized process that is in place uh, that can alert you to maybe past connections that police officers or recruits uh, may have had with white supremacist groups um, 
do you have a way of checking your current police officers who are on the beat now that may be uh, dabbling into white supremacist groups? I have a, a quote here uh, in, in leaked audio, Wilmington, North Carolina, Officer Kevin Piner said, we are just going to go out and start slaughtering blacks, adding that he can't wait for a new civil war so whites could wipe them off the effing map. Mm -hmm. Piner was dismissed from the force and as were two other officers involved in the conversation. And so this culture of white supremacy uh, that is being fed and, um, and, and, and being promoted uh, by entities outside of the police departments, but are being promoted by individuals who are connected to those groups who, who may be operating in a very stealthy way inside of the police departments. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you have in place uh, to check that? Those who are coming in and those who are already in. So we recruit, uh, thank you, doctor. So we recruit uh, to be reflective of the community that we serve. So I'm a firm believer that our demographics need to match the, that of the, of the community at large. And they do. Uh, we've done a really good job of it. Of our, our, if you look at my demographics side by side with the, with, with the county of Bear and, and the residents, the numbers aren't very far off at all. So we've done a great job of it. In fact, my uh, agency is about 80% minority. Uh, we've, uh, you know, over, overwhelmingly Hispanic, but we've, we've got our demographics of African-American officers within the agency uh, match very closely to the demographics within, within the community uh, at large. But with that being said, during the process of, uh, of uh, screening an applicant, which I might add, uh, probably 90%, 90 to 95% of the people that apply to our agency do not get in. Uh, we we actually only hire about five to ten percent of of the applicants that that, that come across our our, our uh, table. But with that being said, part of that process, we look at tattoos. Uh, we will actually have you strip down to your to your uh, to shorts or whatever, uh, and we'll look at your tattoos and we'll photograph those tattoos. Uh, we run them past our our uh, cadre of uh, gang tattoo experts. To make sure that there's no gang affiliation there we also talk to neighbors as part of our process we will actually go out and visit with your neighbors uh we will talk to college professors we will talk to um not just not just the good references that you give me i'm actually going to talk to the people that live around you and so so we think we do a pretty good job of of, of screening out folks uh but it doesn't just end at that i make sure that as they as they go through the promotion process that we're also promoting uh, minorities. And so we've done some things to our promotion process to make sure that, that we're, we're not holding people back based on the color of their skin. Uh, one of the things that, that I did, another controversial change that we made is, is during our, our uh, promotional process, uh, you've got a, an IRB, a review board that you have to speak to. Of If you're promoting to sergeant, then you've got a review board sitting in front of you of sergeants that, have, that are seasoned and you need to be able to, to answer their questions satisfactorily. Well. One of the problems that we saw uh, occurring is that that it, because those uh, five sergeants were appointed by the sheriff, uh, they could actually, in theory, hold somebody back that they didn't want. So if there was a quote unquote undesirable, uh, they, they could hold them back. And so so you would see fewer fewer minorities promoting through a system like that. I actually changed our civil service process to where we bring in. Uh, yes, there's still five sergeants. Uh, but some of them, sometimes more of them, are going to come from outside the agency. So we'll actually bring people in from other agencies that don't have a dog in this fight. Uh, they don't have any loyalties. They don't have any any biases toward anybody there. It's just a matter of making it more fair. So I've got the distinction of, of being able to here recently. I promoted the highest, the, the first ever African-American female captain uh, in the jail, uh, on, on the jail side of the house, uh, Cap Wiggins. She's, she's great at what she does. Uh, and she earned it. She earned every bit of it. She's been with this agency forever and a day, and she's really, really go good at what she does. But I also have the distinction of appointing the first ever uh, African American assistant chief, uh, Avery Walker, uh, in the in the sheriff's office. And so it it goes well beyond uh, just the selection and, and training. You got to make sure that you're carrying on. Again, Emily and I talked about it's a holistic approach. Uh, make sure that you're promoting those people through the ranks and giving them every opportunity to promote uh, and that you're 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 having them mentor some of your younger officers. So that's how you weed out things like suprem white supremacists and 
and anybody with with a, any sort of a gang background. Now, thank you for that. And, and it did got, kind of hit on something, Dr. Taylor, that a, a previous comment that was made and a question was asked. And Sheriff, and this and this really this is for everybody, Emily, Jerry, uh, and Jer uh, and Sheriff. Please ask questions to us. If you have a question for Dr. Taylor, please please ask because this is a conversation and a dialogue. This is not just a <clears throat> question and answer to the the sheriff. Um, you know, online people have gone crazy. I mean, uh oh. We lost the sheriff. He's back. <laughs> All right. That scared me for a second. All right. Uh, you don't want to lose the sheriff. Uh, but uh, people in social media, you know, when, when we post things and people, and you've seen these elected officials post things. Recently, we had a, a uh, an independent school district board person in one of our Edgewood, I believe, ISD post something uh, extremely inappropriate. Uh, with a noose and 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 these things pop up all the time. Comments made, and we, and sometimes we're all guilty of just putting things out there that we regret. Um, how do we gauge now when an officer puts out something online? I think this is Nadia's question. And when you when an officer puts out something online, uh, and it's inappropriate, how much control do we have of of, of uh, punishing these officers for online behavior? So we recently I had recently had a case come across my my desk uh, of a of a young deputy that uh, back when 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 we had the riot that happened here in, in downtown San Antonio first I've sure. ever seen uh, a, a deputy that that you know it, it got and it got out into the media I'm not putting anything out there publicly that's not already out there publicly uh, but he posted uh, something about rioters how do we handle rioters with a little meme a little picture that said kill them all. That's inappropriate, no matter how you look at it. And I can't have somebody that wears this uniform. I cannot, in good conscience, allow that to continue. So we did our, our internal affairs investigation. They ran it. They ran it through uh, the the investigative process. Uh, I actually issued a contemplated uh, a contemplated termination to that deputy uh, going on two weeks ago. And you know he's got his appeals process and he's got his due process. He's out. He's not wearing the uniform. He's not wearing a, a badge. Uh, we pulled his, his peace officer license. I mean, we I say all these things to, to, to demonstrate that we're, we're absolutely uh, doing the right thing. And, and whereas, yes, absolutely, we have a, uh, a right to free speech. Uh, at a certain point, that free speech, when it becomes hate speech, or it, it tends to incite the very violence, the very same type of violence that people are railing against right now, we can't allow it. And so you have to be uh, willing to make that that choice and say, look, I'm drawing the line in the sand here and, and you have no part in this agency. You've got no part in this profession as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, and thank you for this dialogue. I know that some of this stuff is triggering language for, for many of our listeners. This is hard conversations we've had even in the last few weeks of Pup Theology with, with uh, bringing the young ambitious activists. The things we talk about are tough. They can be hard to hear. Know that we are here to say those names. We're you're here to remind ourselves about Botham Jean and Sandra Bland and Eric Garner and George Floyd, Brianna Taylor, and, and the list can continue to go on locally uh, here in San Antonio and nationally when we hear these names. And you know, Dr. Taylor, I'm I'm so glad you're on the program because you got to spend time uh, with Botham Jean's family in Dallas, Texas. We mentioned this earlier. Botham Jean was uh, shot and killed in his own apartment by an off-duty police officer in Dallas, Texas, uh, who's thinking, uh, I believe her, her her reasoning was that it was she thought it was her apartment, and it was a tough case. And, and every one of these cases is somewhat different, right? It, Sandra Bland was was was, t was pulled over for, for, for driving um, and crossing a lane illegally, I believe. I could have that wrong. But um, we have other cases of people being inside their homes and they're shot in their homes. Uh, tell us a little bit about the time you spot you spent with Botham John's family and what that experience meant to you and the, the people you were with from Abilene Christian University and the Carl Spain Center and all the great people. Um, and, and what's the local university in Dallas, Texas? Uh, that's a Church of Christ University. In Dallas? In Dallas or in Arlington area? Uh, there is a Southwestern Christian College. That's right. So they, they all kind of rallied around uh, this family. Tell us about what that experience meant to you. Yeah, it was a very heavy, a, a very heavy experience. Um, am I muted? Can you hear me? No, I think, Sheriff, if you can't hear, just log back on and come back off, and that usually does the trick. 
Okay. All right. I think you might have having trouble hearing us. Sometimes that happens. Okay. Yeah, it, it was a very heavy experience uh, seeing the tears of a mother who would never see her son alive again. Seeing a young brother who will never see his big brother again in his life and a, and a sister and a dad uh, to see how that family was just totally emotionally devastated. Uh, um, you know, not to the fault of Botham and Shen John, um, but I think what that uh, event highlighted for me in dealing with the death of Botham um, and then to see the grief and the anger of the, of the mother and father and family members in the aftermath, uh, to see the role that uh, fear, uh, the role that fear plays in our society today. Uh, we are often uh, portrayed to one another as enemies, potential enemies, threats uh, that we need to view as being dangerous uh, and, and acting before we think, uh, allowing the fear uh, to cause us to do uh, things that could cause uh, the loss of human life. Um, and that, and that experience in Dallas also saw uh, the need uh, for individuals to study more about uh, the power of love, uh, the power of embracing their own human spirit, uh, because if we don't do that, then we cannot show reverence nor value the human spirit that we encounter in others. And so the police officer that uh, took Botham's life, uh, she feared that he proposed a threat to her life, according to what she was saying. And if we are driven by this kind of fear as a society, then God have mercy on us uh, as we move forward in the days ahead. Um, we begin to see each other as common enemies instead of common citizens that share the same nationality. Um, and so uh, that event helped me to understand even more the necessity of, of people from different racial groups being intentional about reaching across the lines of race uh, and trying to experience some type of spiritual connectivity uh, with one another so that they will no longer be afraid. Friends don't fear each other. Um, mm. Friends uh, they see each other as sharing a common humanity. I respect uh, the spirit in you because I see the spirit in you as being connected to the spirit that is in me. We're one. We're one humanity. Um, and so that's what we try to uh, promote there between uh, the crime that was committed and the trial that was coming. We tried to build bridges across racial lines so that people uh, when the verdict of the trial came out, they could be sitting at the table as friends and not uh, standing with fists raised against each other's enemies. Thank you for that. And I want to remind our listeners, you can also ask a question to Dr. Taylor. If you have a good question in line, we have people listening right now. So uh, keep those questions coming. I would love to have a, a listener ask a question to Dr. Jerry, J Dr. Jerry Taylor from Abilene Christian University. Uh, Emily. Yeah, Dr. Taylor, I'm I'm really interested in your perspective, historically speaking. Um, you know, I, this will show my age, but you know, some of the cases that really um, stand out to me or were some of the first cases that I remember were that of Trayvon Martin and Tamir Rice. And um, you know, that, that first movement, well, it wasn't the first movement, but um, most recent movement that happened in 2014. And one thing that's been really interesting for me in looking back at history and looking back at news articles, of course, I knew about Rodney King. There were a lot of other cases beforehand, but it goes back even before then. Um, I was reading a news article from the 1980s where there was a case about a black man that died in San Antonio because he was crossing the street. Um, I'm curious, what? when was one of the first times that you remember a case like that or that you remembered experiencing racism yourself um, and when was that? Yeah, well I grew up in a very racist area in southwest Tennessee 
a little town uh, north of Memphis, uh, and that whole area uh, is still grappling with the stench of white supremacy. Uh, it hides out in the structures that exist there. So as a, as a child, um, I encountered racism and seeing how my parents were treated uh, as we would walk along the rural roads in West Tennessee, not having transportation, we have to walk. Uh, and I remember as a kid, maybe five or six years old, when Carlo, the white people would drive by, and back then they had sodas and bottles, and they would throw those bottles out of the window at us and screaming the word nigger. Uh, and sometimes they would even uh, aim their cars at us and we'd have to jump off the road to keep from being hit. I'm experiencing this as a five or six and seven year old kid. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm very familiar with the spirit of racism and white supremacy. I can sniff it a, a mile away because I grew up in it and had to learn how to psychologically survive in it um, until I could become an adult and to reflect upon uh, the atrocities and the trauma that I had to experience as a young child growing up in that environment. Uh, it is still painful to even have a faint memory of it, uh, the indignity, uh, the dehumanization that uh, we, we had to experience. Um, and so, we are here today as black people in this country, um, reviewed by some of the older white people uh, that uh, may uh, remember back in the 20s and 30s when they had what was known as human zoos. Uh, they would actually have Africans that they brought uh, from the continent of Africa and had them in cages like animals, like gorillas and baboons. Uh, and, and so you have a generation of people that serve as great grandparents and grandparents and children, uh, adult children that live today, who have been trained to see black people not as fully human, even in 2020, uh, that we are just a step above the ape or a step above the gorilla, and intelligent animals uh, that have learned how to, to speak English. That's how some people view us. And so uh, when there is uh, the awareness that that's how we have been viewed, there is something in us that is so spiritual that defies that, that any attempt to disrespect our humanity, it causes us to react in a way to say, that you're not going to do that to me. Uh, that happened to my ancestors, that's not happening today. Uh, and so I think my white brothers and sisters uh, have to realize that we are dealing with a very painful history. And so we engage with people who feel that it is their responsibility to engage uh, in what some would call social dominance orientation, that uh, it is your job to subdue me, uh, to dominate me. Uh, that's what we've lived with all of our lives. And we're trying to to, to, to establish a, a, a position in this country that says we don't want to be dominated anymore. Mm. We want to be respected as fully human. We're just as human as everybody else. Uh, and so uh, that would be my long answer to your short question. Uh, no, that's a beautiful response. And we, we really appreciate you being here and just telling us and reminding us that a dark chapter that continues to lurk in our societies. Uh, in different ways. I, I have a quick question for you. Uh, and we asked this a few weeks ago as well. And it's something that often we hear with, with the news, uh, with different these protests. And a lot of people are, for, you know, are forced to you know, form an opinion. Uh, monuments are getting turned down. Uh, uh, you know, they, uh, some are monuments of power that had just that came up in the 1960s. They're not really monuments of history. They're monuments to suppress the civil rights movement back in the 1960s and 50s. Uh, and so we're reckoning with a lot of things in our past. And so uh, a lot of times in defense, people will say, and usually people of privilege, when they hear the word Black Lives Matter, uh, they'll, they'll say, you know what? I don't know why we say that. Uh, all lives matter, right? And they, they take pride and now champion the common humanity that we all have. How has that been used in the past, this in the way it's done, and this this kind of champion of language. How does inclusive language 
actually have been used to eliminate an injustice or eliminate a voice of a people who are trying to fight for justice. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Dr. Taylor? Yeah. Well, some people have learned that to keep from dealing with a problem with specificity, then you have to uh, turn it into something that is generic. Uh, you know, I, I take one pill a day, thank God, uh, Trail for high blood pressure. Uh, it's the name brand. Uh, last month, they got my order mixed up and gave me a generic brand. Uh, so I had to go back and say, no, I use the name brand. Uh, I didn't want the pharmacist to tell me that all medication matters. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's the name brand or the generic. I know that the generic does not work for me. Uh, it's less potent, in my opinion, based on my personal experience. And so to take the sting out of the claim that Black Lives Matter, there are those who, in some cases, pretend that they cannot understand that statement. Uh, and it has never been easy, in, in many cases, for racism uh, to understand how it is being racist. And so to say that uh, all lives matter, nobody would argue with that. But who would argue with the fact that white skin uh, is just, uh, it, that black skin is just as valued as white skin? So the question is not uh, does black lives matter, do black lives matter, does black skin matter and which skin has more value in this society than the other and if we're honest we know that white skin uh, is treated with greater value than black skin but you can't see my spirit that's locked in the cage of this black skin and i can't see your spirit locked in the cage of your white skin but I can see what I have been taught as an African-American to value as something greater than my own black skin. You know, there are black parents raising black children today uh, when they're asked which doll looks prettier, uh, the white doll or the black doll, at the age of four and five, they're already picking the white doll over the black doll. Now, that didn't just happen by accident. We're being taught and trained in our society in very subtle, subliminal ways that white skin is superior to black skin, that white skin has greater value than black skin. So, uh, yes, all lives matter, but not all skin matters. You know, some skin is, 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 has less value than other skin. So I think if we look at it like that, It'll be easier to understand uh, why there would be such a cry out saying black lives matter. We're saying that the lives in these black skin bodies should matter also as much as the lives that exist in bodies with white skin. You, you brought up a point that I think is just so important um, when you talk about representation and um, one of the most heartbreaking experiences um, that I had recently, um, my, my boyfriend is Latino and um, he has two beautiful nieces who I love to death and um, I would do anything for them. And I make a point to make sure that whenever I get them Barbies, that I get them Barbies that look like them um, because I'm very lucky. I, I always had Barbies that looked like me growing up. And I want them to know that they're beautiful and that they're wonderful and that they're loved. And um, I gave the, I think she was maybe six at the time, six year old, a, a Barbie with this long, beautiful brown hair. And um, she had brown skin, just like Lily. And um, Lily said, looked at the back and the back had two other different kinds of galls, same dress. And Lily said, oh, I like the blonde one. And it just, it broke my heart. I mean, I, I think it's just, it's so sad that that is ingrained in children so early. Mm -hmm. um, but with that in mind, um, I'm curious when you, when you think about all of these issues, when you think about how 
this is so ingrained in our history. What do you think is the next step forward, specifically when we're talking about police and, um, and race? I think we have to uh, use the COVID-19 circumstance that we're in. Uh, we need to use that in a very proactive way. Uh, there is a monastery um, a few hours south of San Antonio called Leb Shemea House of Prayer in Sarita, Texas. Uh, I've been going there since 1988 uh, to be still and to be silent and to be quiet and to be present with the presence of the Creator. And it is my solemn belief that until we can embrace the stillness uh, and the quiet uh, and, and the presence of being in the presence of the divine presence, we will not come to an awareness of our own brokenness, uh, the bitter hatred and the malice and the revenge and the rage that exists within us. It is only when we become quiet that we allow the broken pieces of our humanity to surface to the top. But as long as we are busy running here and there, uh, engaging in all of the distractions of the attractions, we'll never come to know that still place uh, that sits at the very core of our being. And I believe that it is only when we're able to contact that core space within our being, which I believe is the sanctuary of our divine creator. Uh, it is not until we can uh, in, encounter that, that we give up the need to have external power and to abuse external power, to use power to dominate and to uh, destroy the lives of others. Because it is in that space that you realize that you have more than enough. Uh, you, you, you can be content with who you are and what God has called you to be. And so I think we're going to have to get rid of the noise as a society. We're being dragged back and forth here and yonder by so many things in the attention industry that we don't even have the attention span of an ant. And so if I can't pay attention to uh, what's going on in my own heart, soul, and spirit, how can I pay attention to what is harming you uh, as my neighbor or even have any care about you as my neighbor. Mm. Thank you for that. And I want to remind people, we just have a few more minutes left. We have about 10, 10, 15 minutes left. And then we want to respect the time of our listeners and our guests. Um, keep those questions coming, our comments coming. And uh, if you have a question for Dr. Jerry Taylor, and we have a few questions lingering for the sheriff that we'll just get to do in conclusion. Uh, I really, I really want to thank both of you. Um, you know, Dr. Taylor, um, this last question, the last question I have for you, um, really, you've spoken a lot <clears throat> about what's happening in our society today. I've seen you speak at Blaine Christian. I've seen you speak at the, their graduation ceremonies. I've seen you speak at their chapels. Uh, one of the best chapel talks I ever heard was you give uh, about a year ago. Oh, you said uh, in a lot of these uh, talks that what's been brewing here in our society in the last f three or four years, that our leadership in our country has is on a mission, and that mission is to bring back some white supremacist behaviors. Uh, where have you seen this to be true, and how do we stop it? How do we as a community wake up, realize this isn't just a dream, this isn't a joke, this isn't just a, a just something that's going to pass away and just fade away into the sunset if we don't do anything about it? What's happening? What's the source behind it, and what can we do uh, to you know, to, to to fight against it. I mean, we we have a great sheriff on right now who can do a lot. Uh, what can we do? I think it is important for for us as American citizens not to be pulled into an ambush by our external enemy. Now, I'm going to say something here that's going to be controversial. And it's fine, you can be controversial. Could endanger my my life, but that's fine. Uh, Vladimir Putin is not a friend of the United States of America. We need to accept that fact. Uh, the FBI, Homeland Security, the State Department, they have all warned us 
that Vladimir Putin and the uh, Russian imperialist movement, they are funding white supremacist groups in this country uh, for the purpose of stoking a race war in the United States. Now, that's not something I'm pulling out of thin air. But I can't understand for the life of me why Democrats and Republicans, ministers, teachers, have not called a national press conference to wake the American people up to the fact that we are being turned against each other uh, through the provocation and the encouragement of our arch enemy, Vladimir Putin. Uh, and he's stoking uh, hostilities, racial hostilities in this country as I speak. And his game plan is working. Uh, he will never have to fire one missile at the United States because he knows that the greatest threat to our national security has always been racism. And if you unravel that thin thread, then the whole blanket of our society will unravel. And that's what I want to say to us as blacks and whites and Hispanics, Asians, Native Americans. Our house has been set on fire and the arsonist is Vladimir Putin. He has other people that are working on his behalf in this country right now as I speak. And this may be the last time I speak, but I'm going to say it while I can. Uh, white people, black people are not your enemy. And black people, we have to understand that ultimately white people are not our enemy. But we're going to have to live in this house together in a house divided against itself shall not stand. Now, there have been some white people that have acted as our enemies. I want to make that clear. But we have to understand that this white supremacist threat is a global threat. It is happening in Russia. It is happening in Europe. It is happening in Germany. Uh, it is happening globally. And the United States is caught up in it. It is a global effort to topple uh, Western democracies. That's the intent, destabilize the social governmental institutions in this country. And when you have a failed state, then militias and all other hate groups will have open season to take out anybody that they have viewed as their enemies. There have been plots already to assassinate certain politicians. This is a serious matter that we are in as a country and our national leadership should speak up and warn the American people that the fox is in the hen house and he's wreaking havoc. And we're being turned against each other. And I think the only, only way that we can overcome this is understand who our real enemy is um, and right now, uh, he's having great success. The, the social media is running over with, you know, blacks fighting whites, whites fighting blacks, and all of the, the, the racial hatred being spewed out. Uh, so that's my concern. And, um, and I, I'm, I'm going to keep making that case as strong as I can, as long as the Lord let me, uh, that a house divided against itself shall not stand and cannot stand. And we are right now very, very divided. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, that's something that, you know, that's it's interesting to hear your take on that. It's not something that I have thought about before. But I have a question just, just in the United States, uh, in, in Abilene, Texas, in San Antonio, Texas. What can we do? What, what, how can we be aware, have our eyes open, uh, and when it comes to the white supremacist language and how do we how do we fight against it uh, dr taylor yeah i think it has to start within ourselves we have to realize that we've all been raised to be white supremacists including myself um, i've been raised as an african-american male uh, to see whiteness as supreme and so the first place that i have to deal with that is in my heart is not so much the deconstruction of structures of society, but it is the deconstruction of those structures that have set themselves up in my own heart, in my inner space, that uh, distort my humanity, that distort my own view of who I am in the sight of the Creator. And so I would say every individual American citizen has the responsibility in this critical hour uh, to look within your own heart 
uh, and to see whether or not the way that you're living your life is something that has been designed for you by people that are filled with hatred and animosity towards other groups of color? Or are you living in harmony with the purpose of the divine creator that gave you permission to enter into this life? And if we love peace, we love social tranquility, we love uh, what this democratic experiment has stood for and, and sought to fulfill in its own imperfect way, then it's going to be the responsibility of every individual uh, to step up and own this issue uh, as an individual and collectively as a society. And if we don't do that, uh, then we will we will see the total unraveling of our society. I'm just praying to God that we don't experience an economic crash because uh, if that happens, uh, then I think our external enemies will have succeeded uh, or will succeed in seeing us implode in upon ourselves. So I think that's what we need to do. If, if we have not reached out to other people beyond our social and political groups, we need to do so now. We need to hold our elected officials, uh, both uh, Republicans and Democrats, accountable. Some of us go to church uh, with senators and Congress people. We need to have uh, honest to God conversations with them uh, to encourage them to step forward and warn the American people uh, to the threat that we're facing. They have all kinds of reports that they've given to the Senate Intelligence Committee, but the American people don't even know that those reports have been given. Nobody's warning us uh, that the House is on fire. Uh, so uh, I think that's, that's the direction that we need to go in together, uh, collectively as a country, uh, because all of our safety is at risk today, it's not just from coronavirus, but from violence in the streets. All right, thank you for that. Uh, we want to conclude our time. Emily has a few more questions. Uh, we'll try to get to a few questions uh, again. And I and I know that this is something. This is a challenging conversation. Uh, we we live in a, in a world right now that is torn, that is hurt, that is in pain, that is confused, that doesn't know what believe what really facts or facts are. Every fact seems to be you know not real facts, and it's spin, and and people are really confused and hurting and 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 want to be angry. I see the comments. Uh, I want you to know that both of these men are my guests. Uh, they're in my house right now. Uh, I might have challenging things to ask Sheriff Zalazar. I might have challenging things to ask uh, Dr. Taylor and Emily, and we're all going to fight for this and, and, and not avoid tough questions. Uh, but these comments that I'm seeing also don't do me uh, a lot of good because what we're really about here is creating dialogue that we can grow together in. And so uh, I know there are a lot of people who might be frustrated. So it's an elected official online, but Sheriff, um, I know things aren't perfect. I know everything you have done is not perfect, uh, but right. what we can do is get better. Uh, and so thank you for being on this program. Uh, I, and really pub theology, it sounds really kind of like an online program, but remember guys, we're a dialogue a group that meets at a bar where we believe that different brews and different views happen. And we're not afraid of different views. Uh, and right. different views make us better. Uh, and so the people talking and, and blowing up our, our, our feed, uh, really, uh, I, it's fine. I, I really, I, you can say those things and we're not going to censor you. Uh, I don't really have time to. <laughs> but right. thank you for being on. And Dr. Taylor, thank you for your words of challenging and, and academic as they might be, because now I have to go think about Russia now. Now I'm going to go back and think <laughs> about Russia all night long. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, Emily's got a few more questions and, uh, and, and thank you for the comments, even, even the ones I can't really understand. And, uh, you know what guys, let's, let's love one another. Let's have peace and love. And I guarantee you, you don't have to vote for the guy, but we can still love each other. Uh, but you know, these comments, let's, let's do better than that. Uh, Emily. Yeah, Sheriff, you know, as, as we talk about these issues of race, um, and we talk about the importance of telling stories. Uh, which I am a huge believer in. Um, that's why I got into journalism is because I believe that we can all find commonality in these sure. stories. Um, if we know each other's experiences, we are more likely to um, respect one another and understand where people are coming from, you know, the whole different views. Um, so Sheriff, I'm, I'm curious, 
um, you know, you've been in law enforcement for 25 years. Were there ever any experiences uh, where you experienced or you witnessed racism um, from a fellow officer? I don't want you to throw anyone under the bus, but I'm, I'm curious if you ever um, saw any of these things happening and what that was like for you and, um, you know, how you handled it. Well, so certainly um, I've, I've faced my share of, of racism uh, as well. I've been referred to as that little Mexican sheriff more times than I care to mention. Um, and, and so you, you handle it with knowing that, that uh, you know, when you hold public office, you, you have to expect a certain amount of that. You don't, you know, you don't uh, like it, but, but it's there. Uh, there. There's ignorance everywhere. Uh, and so you just, but you've still got a job to do. Uh, you know, I, I am not the sheriff uh, only for Democrats or only for Republicans or only for black or only for white or only for Hispanic. I'm the sheriff for everybody that lives in this county, 2 million Bear County residents. And, and they can all uh, count on me to, to do my duty uh, right up to my dying breath. Uh, and and they, can, they can all rest assured that I'm gonna demand the same of, you know, of each and every one of my deputies no matter what the color of your skin is, uh, no matter what, uh, you know, what you're accused of or what you're suspected of, we're going to do our job. Thank you. Uh, I have one question before, and I'm, uh-oh, did you, did, did, can you hear me? Everybody good? No, did, did, could you, could, could you hear we what heard I you. You, yeah. Did y'all hear that? Yeah, we heard okay, you. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, thank you for okay. sharing. Uh, I have one more question for the sheriff. And that is, you know, I did a ride along one time uh, with a friend of mine who's a police officer in Montgomery County, Texas, which is kind of the Conroe area yeah. of, of, of Texas, North Houston. Um, mm -hmm. And I was a really late night ride along. Uh, and this is maybe 10 years ago. He, he was a guy I went to high school with. He's now an officer there. He was a constable for a little bit, which we didn't even get into constables. That's a whole new confusing <laughs> aspect. Don't even get we me started. <laughs> sheriffs and constables. We just got to put them together. Yeah. But that's my own piece. But he, he, but he was a, I, he might have been a constable at the time. I can't remember. But we were riding along, and he went up to a very intense situation. That a, a man was at a gas station that was very upset. He was uh, disturbing the peace. He was very angry. He might have been intoxicated. And the officer had to approach this individual. And my friend approached him, and the guy spit on him. He, you know, my uh, the officer was just covered in spit. And I thought Jake. I was like, oh man, I don't know what's going to go down. But Jake kept his composure the entire time, and 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 you know, got the man settled. He, he, he did take him into the back of the car, but very peacefully. Like, uh, it was such a crazy experience to me because I thought Jake had every right in my young body, like, Oh, just lay this guy out. He is acting inappropriate. And Jake said to me, he's not mad at me. Right. He's not, exactly. he's not mad at me. I, I can't take it personally as an officer. I have to do my job to keep not only this man safe, but these people around me. Right. Um, and, you know, we, we see now these officers uh, say, well, it's, yeah, I have to defend myself. I have to, you know, where have we lost in a little bit in our training where we are actually as officers defending the public? We're, we're defending even the person that spits on us, right? And there are bad things that might happen to a police officer that's unfortunate, uh, just like a person serving in the military is taking a risk. Uh, how can we get back to this training? And we And one of the questions was about police brutality, about how a lot of people say, well, I was just defending uh, my my life. I think the question, and I'm going to go back to it because I want to respect this, but I have to go back to all the comments that um, they, they were talking about just using the excuse of, um, of defending themselves, right? And then they'll say that, especially against people of color. Uh, how do we get back to a culture in our training to really, our sheriffs, our police officers are really going to at last resort right? Take any type of brutal action. Well, so again, it goes back to way before you even start the training academy. You've got to make sure that you're recruiting the right kind of folks that are reflective of the community, that you're going through a rigorous selection process. As I mentioned, we've got, we've got about 13 steps in our selection process. That they've got to clear. Uh, and if you're taking, and to me, if you're taking any more than five to 10% of those applicants uh, at the end of it, then you're really doing yourself a, a disservice, in my humble opinion. 
Um, and so, and so then you, you go through even, even the, the academy process is a weeding out process. They're not all going to make it through the academy. You're going to find weaknesses. You're going to find little, little ticks, little habits that maybe they even didn't even know that they had. And you're going to hopefully at the end of it all, uh, and then knowing full well, they're going to be held accountable if they step out of line to a certain extent. Um, you've got to create that officer, that, that fine officer, like what you described there, that doesn't take it personally, that understands but look, this guy's not spitting at, at me. He's not spitting at Javier Salazar. He's spitting at this. And, and as disrespectful as that is, you cannot take it personally. I haven't read the comments you keep referencing from, from the keyboard Rambos that, that are uh, out there hurling insults. I haven't read them. I don't know that I will read them. But again, when you read stuff like that, you just got to consider the source and, and you know, not take it personally. Uh, they may or may not be lashing out at me, but they're lashing out at my profession, which, which clearly... Uh, we've demonstrated that we just we absolutely need to do better. People at the end of the day are, are asking us to do our job better. Uh, and, and I'm on the same page. I want us to do better as well as a profession. Thank you. Emily, do you have any final thoughts or, or questions? And I really want to thank you for being here. You've covered uh, this challenging time with integrity uh, and not being f afraid to ask challenging questions. Uh, Emily told me earlier, you know, as a reporter and I had Usually our co-hosts are reporters here on Pub Theology sometimes, uh, and they sometimes do their job well, even though sometimes they, when they're asking challenging questions to the police department or the, the sheriff's office, it's not a fun question to ask, but you have to ask it. Uh, what are some final thoughts that you have? And, and you can ask any question that you want to this panel. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sure the sheriff has not liked some of my stories before. But <laughs> I appreciate that he still always talks to me um, and answers my questions. Always, always. Um, yeah, you know, I the the question that I I still have, and um, I don't want to beat the the same drum over and over again, but I'm I just how do we move forward? You know, and um, we talked a little bit about this in that um, we we want to. Um, you know, whether we're doing small changes or large structural changes. Um, but I'm curious, Sheriff, what are you committed to doing over the next six months, over the next year, um, to make sure that this is an important conversation within your department and to make sure that once the protests have died down and once the news reports reporters have gone away, that this is an issue you're still focused on addressing? So, you know what I'm going to do is just continue to do what we've been doing. As I mentioned, this what the, what we've been seeing, what's being demanded of law enforcement, uh, the situation that this country finds itself within. Um, I got to tell you, it, it serves as an affirmation to me that we're absolutely we're on the right track. Uh, we're being selective on who we bring in. We're running them through the ringer on the selection process. We're training the heck out of them and retraining the heck out of them. We're teaching them police ethics. Uh, we're, we're holding them accountable. Uh, we've got my internal affairs unit that, that absolutely does their job uh, to a T. I've got my public integrity unit that, that will absolutely arrest. Uh, they'll have completely investigated. And if it calls for an arrest, they will absolutely make an arrest or file the case. Uh, those public integrity unit detectives that I have, are I've got several of them assigned to the FBI's uh, public corruption task force. Uh, we're always constantly rewriting our policies. And with all of this holistic approach that I take on to, to assuring accountability, uh, you're never done with it. It's a bit like construction on 1604. Uh, when you think that you're done, you go to the beginning and start over again and <laughs> add another lane. And so it's never going to end. And I just want you know the, the taxpayers of Bear County to know that, that whether my career here is another four years or another 24 years, I will have left it all on the field when I'm done. Thank you, Sheriff. I, I really appreciate both of you being here. I'm going to let the pastor and the reverend close this out uh, with a word. Uh, but before, before we go, um, none of us um, have all the answers. Uh, I really believe that we're all made in the image of God, but we're all different parts of that body, right? We're all in this body, body and some of us are the hands, some of us are the feet, some of us are different parts of the body that I can't even explain. Uh, but we all serve a purpose, even when I don't understand what that purpose is. And we have to start seeing each other like that. And um, we can't be afraid to not 
uh, of you know to to see an injustice and not speak about it because we're afraid of the ramifications or we're afraid of what that might be. I, I know pastors still to this day are like, you know, I would love to support Black Lives Matter, but I just can't say it, and and we're just avoiding the injustice before our eyes. And so I want to do say Black Lives do matter, uh, and what Jerry Taylor has called us to be, and what what the the, the Carl Spain Center uh, challenges us each to be is to be better and see each other in a way. And when there's an injustice that is actually happening, we call it out specifically, right? And we said it last week and the week before, uh, when a Samaritan life was, was, was on the side of the street in need, Jesus said a Samaritan lives matter. He didn't say this all lives matter and we're gonna keep going with this. No, some, at that moment, a Samaritan life matter. And we get the parable of the good Samaritan, right? We say that name. And so I really want to say those names. And so keep saying those names online. You can post that all you want. Keep saying those names because they matter. Uh, so, uh, Sheriff, thank you for being here and asking. Thank you. Uh, if, let, let it just ask you hard questions. Uh, that's not easy. I am, uh, you know, she's used to it. I'm always like, oh, man, I don't even want to be here. But uh, <laughs> I'm a pastor. I'm like, I want to be good cop. I want to be good cop. <laughs> uh, but you're not afraid and and thank you for being this and i want you to know and i'll say it we've invited we invited people from the san antonio police department they declined uh, to be on tonight for various reasons it doesn't mean they didn't want to be on uh, but you did come and say yes so uh and, and thank you and there is an election coming up and so i want the voters we don't endorse anybody here at pup theology but you can go and learn about the people running right uh you can go and 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 cast your ballot you don't have to post things online that are just me you can actually go out there and do good. And, and Sheriff, thank you for, for being at least honest with me and honest uh, sure. with us tonight. And uh, I know things are challenging and they're hard to manage, but I don't want you to know, I, I saw you out on the streets. I saw you there communicating with the protesters and standing alongside, and that's not always easy to do. Uh, Emily, now it's a question for you. Uh-oh. Right? <laughs> Okay. okay. Yeah, it's not. It's not so. It's not so fun when it's you, is it, Emily? Sheriff, <laughs> <laughs> now I have to ask an intelligent question. Like, I feel like in this panel, I feel like a pair of brown shoes with three tuxedos. Like, I don't match. I don't. I don't fit here. I. I'm the kid that that shouldn't be here with these three amazing guests. But uh, Emily, uh, in the last few minutes, what have you seen happening? And in your opinion. As a, as a reporter who's been covering this, what's the next major step we have to take? We've talked about the eight changes that need to happen and, and that have been promoted through the different uh, protest groups. Is there something within that eight? Is there something that's not within that eight that you would like to see done that you probably see that's like, this is the most crucial, crucial next step? You know, we can talk about a lot of different things. We, there have been comments about defunding police and what that, what that mantra means. I also think that word is also like defund police. I think people hear it and they want to attack it and they don't really want to know what the meaning of that protest is, but that's for a different discussion. Uh, we always have more conversation to have it at Pup Theology. So for your sake, what is the next step that we can take uh, to make this, this better? That's a really good question. Um, I'm going to give a, a partially completely reporter's uh, answer, which is that, you know, my job is not necessarily to make an opinion about what the next steps are. Sure. My job is to listen and to, um, and to vet the facts and to inform readers about all the different policies that are out there and all the different choices. But at the end of the day, one thing that I, and I, I sort of have already said this earlier, but I'll get back on my soapbox again. One thing that I really believe in is the power of stories. And I think that I, I think we probably are beyond the point of having a police community relations committee. Um, that might be a good step. I think possibly it needs to be more than that. But I think if we can all get on the same page and try to see each other's differences and see each other's commonalities, that we can come up with a solution. Um, someone commented earlier when we were talking about language and about all lives matter versus black lives matter. And someone brought up that that's very similar to the conversation about defund the police. Um, it's not necessarily means that we're gonna completely defund the police and that there won't be police departments and there won't be peace officers on the streets that could respond to a crime. 
um, that that could still be, you could still defund the police, the government could still defund the police and still have peace officers. It just, um, at least in some protesters' minds, the idea of defunding the police is about funding other services, funding social services, uh, funding mental health, funding, um, you know, trying to get rid of homelessness, um, trying to get all, rid of all of those other social ills that can contribute to crime. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not gonna say, oh, we need to defund the police or we don't need to defund the police. But I think if we can come together and we can learn what we're all talking about and share each other's experiences, um, that I think we can come up with some solutions and some compromises, and um, and it we'll we'll all be better for it. Thank you so much, uh, Emily. Thank you. Keep reporting. Keep you know asking those tough questions. Uh, again, sheriff, if uh, people want to go to Bear County Sheriff, it's right there. BearCountySheriff.com. Uh, you can mm -hmm. learn to be engaged. Uh, in this process of change. Uh, he's sure. going to take suggestions. So the people commenting, write those emails, make those challenges, make those things, uh, and, and we can be a better society. And thank you for allowing us to speak into that process at the Bear County Sheriff's Department. Uh, again, sure. remember, go out and speak to your elected officials. Go and speak to your county commissioners when it comes to Bear County, uh, your San Antonio uh, City Council when it comes to the city. Remember, those are different, uh, but they're kind of the same elected bodies over a county versus a city. Uh, and they're the ones that strike those deals with the police union. So if you really want to see change happen, talk to those two groups uh, and really see what we can do better. But uh, the Bear County Sheriff is going to take our, our uh, listen to us and the people in this department are going to listen to us. Go to BearCountySheriff.com. Learn more about that. Uh, stay with us real fast. Uh, the, uh, Dr. Jerry Taylor, you can go to CarlSpainCenter.org to learn all about what's happening at the Carl Spain Center and tell us again what's happening um, this Saturday, if people want to get involved, uh, we're having um, a virtual gathering of uh, spiritual think tanks that we have organized. Uh, they've been working together over the past several weeks, uh, studying uh, material related to police reform uh, and rooting those discussions in the context of prayer, fast, and meditation, uh, study, debate, um, having healthy discussions wrestling, uh, but doing so with an awareness that, that we're doing so in the presence of our creator, who is the most creative being there is in all of the universe, duh, because he created the universe. He created us as we live in this world. And if we're looking for creative solutions, we need to go to the creative creator that can pour into our human minds a wisdom and an intelligence that is not of this world. I think we need to add that type of spirituality uh, to every walk of life, whether that is uh, police officers, politicians, and even preachers and pastors. Uh, yeah. We need to reclaim uh, a healthy spirituality even in our politics. Um, we got, we got the language all on our money. We got it in our pledge one nation under God, in God we trust, all this God language, but it seems as if people are afraid to, uh, you know, say that they have a faith or a belief in that God. And really, if you can't be reconciled to the creator of life, you will never know how to reverence the life that that creator has created. And so that's what we, we will be talking about uh, during our virtual gathering on Saturday, and uh, we have uh, four presenters that will be uh, kind of reviewing the material that we've covered uh, over the past uh, four or five weeks together. All right. Thank you. GarlSpainCenter.org. And you can also, there is a link uh, in our comments where you can actually sign up to be one of those prayer think tanks in the Eventbrite link. And we'll post it again because uh, all these other comments have come up. Again, Sheriff, thank you for being with us. Uh, continue. Uh, serving us and we, we we trust you we trust you to make these changes and uh we trust that you're going to work with the police departments and the other police departments around town to really make law enforcement a much uh safer place to be as citizens and people of color uh dr taylor thank you for the work you do at the carl spain center uh we'll continue to support you it means so much to me um you know uh, i only knew my granddad for a few years maybe he died when i was 10 uh but the time i had with him uh 
I don't remember everything. So you're you continuing to tell his story uh, means a lot to me because I never got to hear it much when I was little, and I get to hear it through you, and that means a lot to me. So uh, I appreciate everybody's time. I get a little emotional not just about that, even about these comments because you guys really mean a lot to me to come on this show uh, and to really talk uh, to each other. So Sheriff, uh, Dr. Taylor, thank you for taking valuable time. Two hours now. I went over. I went over twenty-five minutes. And uh, okay. uh, to 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 talk to, and and it's valuable time. And I I wish you both well, uh, Emily. Thank you for being here. She's the first time guest on our show, and uh, we didn't get to know each other until just a few days ago. And I'm 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 uh, glad to know you in our community as well. And I will do better. You know, as a person, I will also do better to learn where I can have racism creep up in my life, where I can creep up in the things I do, the things I say, the things I act, even when I think I'm doing good. We all need to continue to work on our language, work on engaging one another that are different from us, even when it's hard to hear. And I know all four of us on this panel believe in that. And uh, so thank you for being on this program. Uh, uh, next week, we'll continue this dialogue wherever it leads us. Uh, but thank you for joining and uh, peace and love and be nice to each other. Cause I guarantee you being nice goes a long way. Hey guys, thank you so much. Y'all stay on. Thank you. Uh, we're going to end this broadcast, but you guys stay on. And uh, you know what? I think everybody needs to go drink a beer. <laughs> 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 That's great. <laughs>